Good morning. Today is uh, Palm Sunday, and it will be the first time that I have made any reference uh, to the season of Lent. And because of that, I would like to say a sincere thank you to all of you who are lifelong uh, UMC Methodist. No one has mentioned, no one has commented, no one has questioned uh, the fact that I have not been preaching a series uh, or a Lenten series. I really do appreciate that. But if anybody had raised the issue, I have a perfect response, and it is this. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which I seem to make reference to uh, in every message I've delivered for the last uh, four or five weeks, is a perfect Lenten verse, even though it is obviously uh, from the Old Testament. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and uh, heal their land. Now tell me, <laughs> is there a better text to focus on in, uh, during Lent? Uh, God has laid out for us in that verse four action items that we are to do in order to bring honor to him and to strengthen our relationship with him, humble ourselves, abandon the facade or the, uh, the perspective that we are self-sufficient. We need God in every area of our lives. Pray, confess our sin, seek his face, diligently seek God simply uh, because of who he is and wanting a relationship with him. And then turning from our wicked ways, living righteously before God every day. Then God promises to hear from heaven and to forgive our sins and to heal us, heal our land. What a better way to instruct Christ's followers as they uh, uh, seek to uh, live righteously before God at any time of the year, not just Lent. It is, I have always maintained, that these qualities, these spiritual qualities that God speaks of here in Second Chronicles, uh, and that we tend to emphasize during Lent, uh, are qualities that we should demonstrate every day before God. And not exclusively uh, during Lent. And the fact that this is an Old Testament text really um, turns my crank <laughs> because it makes another incredibly important point. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He never changes. His de desire for relationship with us based on these qualities and, and faith in Jesus Christ is the same in the Old Testament new. He, he never uh, changes. The only thing that has changed is the fact that God came in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to earth to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that is to resolve our sin problem. Jesus came to bring us peace with God. Paul teaches us that in multiple places, but I'm thinking of Romans chapter 5. He came so that the Holy Spirit would come and motivate, empower, direct us, guide us on how to live righteously before God every day, because we cannot do that on our own. And that brings us to the significance of today, Palm Sunday the day that Jesus entered uh, into Jerusalem to accomplish uh, his purpose uh, or the purpose, the will of God his Father. And quite frankly, as I thought about this uh, message uh, it, it, and the significance of it and how to, how to make it fresh 
You know, when you you preached on Palm Sunday and Easter for so many years, it, uh, you you want the the message here to be um, from a new perspective, something that uh, that we can latch on to and uh, uh, impress on us the significance of this event. Well, God brought to my attention uh, our text today, which is in John's Gospel. You might turn there in your Bibles, chapter 12, um, and that there's a series of uh, characters who uh, were eyewitnesses to this event. Uh, and uh, they were there. They saw Jesus uh, come into Jerusalem. Because um, we want to see how they responded to Jesus. We'll see that there were different responses. Because when all is said and done, the truth is, how we respond to Jesus uh, is the most important choice we make in all of life. Not only does it impact uh, the quality of our life now on this plane, uh, but it impacts uh, and determines the quality of our lives for all of eternity. So the title of my message this morning is, It All Depends on How You Look at It. And I was thinking back in the day when offices actually had uh, a real water cooler, you know, that big five-gallon jug of uh, water that uh, people would gather around on occasion and uh, they would discuss uh, a topic or so. You know, politics of some major sporting event, uh, the weather, whatever. And uh, the cliche that w was a signal that it was time to stop uh, beating it up, beating the topic up, and go back to work was, well, it all depends on how you look at it. Now, actually, that cliche contains a very significant uh, message. Everyone has a choice to make. We all just decide for ourselves how we're going to look at and respond to uh, any particular topic, but for our purposes this morning, we're looking at the coming of Jesus to Jerusalem, coming into our lives uh, as the Messiah of God. Who is he? Why did he come to earth? And most importantly, how do I respond to him? So how did uh, these characters who were eyewitnesses to this event of uh, see Jesus and respond to him. Chapter 12, John's Gospel, verse 1, John sort of sets the uh, context for us in that he specifies uh, the location that uh, this chapter opens with. He writes, six days before Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived. Now, Bethany um, would be to uh, Jerusalem as maybe Tin City is uh, to Wallace. Uh, new folks like us make no distinction between, don't, we don't even know we're in Tin City, it's so mu much a part of uh, Wallace. But those who were born and raised here, have been here any number of years, realize that Tin City uh, was just on the outskirts of old Wallace, um, but it's very close. You could walk from Tin City uh, to the Piggly Wiggly grocery store uh, on a sunny afternoon with no problem. And that's where this story starts. Um, from the text, we see uh, that uh, Jesus' disciples were with him. Listen, um, he had gone to Bethany, uh, where Lazarus lived. So Jesus had now gone to uh, the home of Lazarus, who you remember, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And we know that, as we said, the disciples are with him because his ultimate destination the next day uh, would have been uh, Jerusalem, the beginning of Holy, what we call Holy Week, 
they were preparing for the Passover feast uh, coming up the following Friday. So here's the first group of characters. Jesus, his disciples, and his best human friends here on earth when he was here. Mary and Martha, two sisters, uh, and uh, their brother Lazarus. Now we know from the text uh, earlier in chapter 11 of John's Gospel uh, that they had uh, openly acknowledged and seen Jesus as uh, the Messiah of God, the Messiah for coming to the Jews, that he was in fact the Son of God. Now in verse 9 of chapter 12 we meet a second group of characters that come to Bethany, a crowd uh, who come. John writes this, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was at Bethany. And so they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, John doesn't give us any more detail than that uh, in this particular passage, but back in verse 45 of chapter 11, uh, he says that among uh, that crowd, the people, um, many had seen what Jesus did. He raised Lazarus from the dead. They watched Lazarus come out of the tomb after being dead for four days. And they put their faith in him, meaning Jesus. But not all of them did. So it's safe to assume that this crowd that gathered uh, in Bethany, because they heard that Jesus was there, uh, was made up of uh, believers uh, but perhaps not uh, all were believers. Uh, some were uh, maybe just curious onlookers. But you know, as we look through the gospel record, we see that Jesus in his public ministry always um, caused large crowds to gather. Some accepted his teachings and became disciples, followers of Jesus. Uh, some rejected his teachings uh, out of hand. They, they said he was nuts. He had lost his, uh, his, his way in life. And others just sort of put off making a decision at all. And here's another uh, validation of one of my other uh, assertions in ministry, and that is that nothing spiritually has changed between people of the old or the ancient world and people of the 21st century. Because isn't this how people respond to Jesus today, to the gospel of God? Some believe, accept it, and become followers of Jesus. They come into the family of God. Others scoff, reject the gospel, reject Jesus and his teachings. Others simply display indifference. Their choice is to make no choice which God does see as a choice, by the way, but that's another sermon. <laughs> in verse 12, we see a third group of characters, a second crowd. John writes this, On the next day, the great crowd that had come uh, for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So these folks are in Jerusalem, hearing Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, uh, from Bethany, which is, like I said, a hop, skip, and a jump, not, not far at all. So they took palm branches, and they went out onto the roadway, the pathway, uh, to meet him. And they began shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this crowd is a bit different than the first crowd that we met in verse 9. Because this crowd including people, included people uh, who were from all over Palestine. They had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. It was really a big deal. And, and uh, estimates are that uh, Jerusalem would grow by uh, two and two and a half times its normal population. And many of these people weren't even Jewish. Uh, John refers to them as Greeks, which is his way of referring to Gentiles. So there are a couple of things about this second crowd that comes out onto this uh, pathway to greet Jesus that uh, caused me to stop and ponder. The first was their cry, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
which literally translates into English, save now, save now. Now that is either a very theologically astute, perceptive insight in that they are acknowledging that they knew that Jesus had come to Jerusalem to die for their sins the following Friday. Or save now meant that they wanted and expected Jesus to throw off uh, the burden uh, the uh, oppression of, of the Roman occupation. They wanted Jesus to lead a revolt, as it were, uh, and establish his kingdom and get rid of the Romans. But you see, that would uh, contradict everything that Jesus had said during his public ministry, that they misunderstood why Jesus had come to earth, what his purpose was. Because Jesus said over and over again, that his kingdom was not of this world. His kingdom was a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. Well, the second thing that catches my attention about this crowd is, I wonder how many who were uh, caught up in the uh, celebratory uh, event of uh, this famous teacher, Jesus, who did all these miracles, coming into town, and so they're shouting with the crowd, Hosanna. But I wonder how many of them on Friday were standing in the court of Pilate and shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You see, many in this crowd had very um, self-serving expectations. That's how they looked at it. They had no interest in Jesus and his spiritual a nature and the spiritual purpose for which he came uh, to Jerusalem or came to earth, period. But isn't that true today, too? How many people create false expectations and false teachings about the person and the purpose of Jesus? They create a whole system of uh, religious uh, traditions around a mischaracterization of who Jesus is uh, was and what his purpose was. Oh, they do some very wonderful, good things. There's no doubt about that. And they actually claim to do them in Jesus' name. But they don't know the real Jesus. And Jesus taught when he was here on earth that on Judgment Day, he's going to look at these very people and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. And then he's going to call them evil doers. So it is so important that we learn about and follow the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus that we create in our own minds, not a Jesus that we want uh, him to be, but the Jesus that he revealed to us, both in his presence on earth and through the scriptures, uh, that this is who he is. Well, in verse 36, we see another group, a fourth group of characters, uh, the disciples, the apostles, the twelve. John writes this, at first his disciples did not understand all of this. They didn't understand all of this parade-like uh, uh, celebration uh, as Jesus was going into uh, Jerusalem. John goes on, only after Jesus was glorified, that means he was uh, crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected, actually went back to heaven and the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. So after he was glorified, the Holy Spirit comes. Then they realized that these things uh, had been written about him. The Old Testament prophets spoke about each of these events that they had witnessed. They didn't get it at first. They didn't understand. And Jesus is going to has been teaching them all through his public ministry. And Thursday of this week, um, this Holy Week, he's going to begin his final uh, teaching session, if you will. Uh, it's chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 of John's Gospel. But they didn't get it until the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And then they looked back on all of these events, and they understood uh, that Jesus was fulfilling uh, all of the Old Testament prophecies about being the Messiah. 
Now, the fifth group of people that we meet uh, are the Jewish religious leaders. Um, how did they look at it? How did they respond to Jesus? Well, each of the gospel records uh, ref uh, record for us the fact that they didn't <laughs> respond to Jesus uh, very well at all. They were not pleased uh, that he had come on the scene. From the very beginning, Jesus taught the crowds uh, that uh, their righteousness would have to be a greater, would have to exceed the righteousness of the religious leaders if they had any hope of entering his kingdom. And that certainly angered the religious leaders because they thought of themselves as very righteous. But Jesus was teaching that they were not righteous enough. They did not meet God's standard of righteousness to get into his kingdom. Why? Because their righteousness was their righteousness, not God's righteousness. That comes to us as a gift from God because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. These religious leaders um, hadn't done that. They didn't have the opportunity to put faith in Jesus yet. Uh, well, other than accepting him as the Messiah, but he hadn't died on the cross for their sins yet. Although we see uh, from the gospel record that several of them had quietly uh, become followers of Jesus, but they didn't dare speak out for fear of retribution from the other religious leaders. All through uh, Jesus' public ministry, uh, the religious leaders harassed him, chased him. Uh, but the truth is they didn't know how to look at it either. They didn't know how to respond to him. You know, if you were to look back in uh, John's Gospel, I think uh, it's chapter 10, but look back a couple of chapters, you will find Jesus teaching in the temple one day. And a whole large group of these religious leaders come and they surround him so he can't uh, escape. And they ask him point blank, are you the Messiah? This late in his uh, public ministry and having heard all of his teaching and seen all of his miracles, and they're asking him, are you the Messiah? So that is clear evidence that they didn't know how to look at it. They didn't know who Jesus was because they didn't know their own scriptures. Oh, they were experts in the Jewish law, what they called the Jewish law, which is what they had written. They had taken what God gave Moses and they changed it. They modified it. They would quote this rabbi and that rabbi going back uh, decades as authoritative but they didn't know the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament prophets. They had rejected their Old Testament prophets. They didn't believe in them. Well, when they saw this crowd responding to Jesus on that day, going into Jerusalem, they determined to kill him. Listen as John writes in verse 19 of chapter 12. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world is going after him. Now, this confirms a decision that they had already made a couple of days earlier. If you read chapter 11, verse 45 through the end of the chapter, you will see that they had this meeting uh, and the high priest Caiaphas had come and spoken to them. And um, they had devised uh, a plan, an agenda, uh, that Jesus had to go for the sake of the nation and for their sake because they were afraid of losing their political and social religious uh, clout, that the Romans would come and take it away from them. And so they had determined to kill Jesus, verse 53 of chapter 11. Now, John doesn't tell us, actually, in his version of Palm Sunday, how Jesus looked at this whole event. But Luke does. Dr. Luke, in chapter 19, verse 41, writes this. As Jesus approached Jerusalem, he's coming down the road, riding on the donkey. He saw the city as he comes to the edge of the hill of Mount Olive. And he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. 
Jesus knew that some of the people that were shouting Hosanna were going to be call, calling for his crucifixion just a few days later. He knew that the people that he had come to, his own people, that he had come to save, to fulfill their Old Testament prophets, the Jews, they had rejected him. It was a done deal. And it broke his heart. And so he wept. Well, there's a sixth group of people that we see in verse 20 and 21 uh, of chapter 12, back in our text. John writes this, there were some Greeks, now he means Gentiles, that's how he, how he refers to them. And they had come to Jerusalem for this Passover feast and to worship. And they went to Philip and they said, we would like to see Jesus. Well, why is that so important? All through Jesus' public ministry, for the most part, he had exclusively uh, put his focus and his ministry uh, directed toward the Jewish people. Um, but now, based on the fact that they had rejected him and what he just said in uh, Luke's gospel, in chapter 19, verse 41, uh, he was affirming the fact that God had... Uh, uh, understood uh, that or made arrangements for Gentiles to now come into uh, the kingdom to become part of uh, the family of God. You see, the, the Gentiles, the Greeks, as John calls them, said they wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus had just said about the Jews that it, meaning him and the peace that he would bring, the salvation that he would bring, it was hidden from their eyes. Notice that all through the gospel record, including John's, the verb used is they wouldn't accept. Now it's hidden from their eyes, meaning they couldn't accept God's choice. They made the choice to reject. They wouldn't accept. God made the choice to put a veil over their eyes so that they couldn't accept. The lesson for us is that it's a very dangerous thing to see Jesus, to experience Jesus coming to us and not responding to him, to reject him. There are consequences now in this life and for all of eternity. So each of this groups of people that we see, these characters, had their own way of looking at and uh, responding to Jesus. As I said, some of them accepted his message and accepted him as the Messiah, celebrated life as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Others were uh, indifferent, noncommittal. Others sought and were successful, they thought, in killing Jesus. But the truth is, none of this really matters today. The only thing that really matters today is how you look at Jesus and how you respond to Jesus. Does seeing Jesus cause you to think differently? Have your values in life changed? Does responding to Jesus mean to you that you seek to live righteously before God? That's what matters. So the question is, how do you look at it? Have a great week. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to suffer and die for us, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves and deal with our sin. And in you, we now have life we um, can face any circumstance because we have your strength and your presence with us. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. See you on Easter.